Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the session, uh, improving your legacy applications this spring. I'm Martin Dynam. I'm a consultant working for a small consulting firm in the Netherlands. So if you might see some menus which you don't understand, that might be because they're in Dutch. I have about 16, 16 years experience in the field of Java development. And next to that, I'm a father and a husband. I authored two books, which you might know, Spring Recipes, the third edition, and Pro Spring MVC with Webflow. Next to the authoring and my day job, I'm also very active on Stack Overflow and uh, formerly the Spring Community Forums. So you might know me from there. Um, as was so put nicely in the invitation, I'm the I'm a Spring Community Rockstar, apparently, so I took the title and put it into the slides. Before I start, just I want to talk about I want to run through a little bit of history. Java is almost 20 years old now, if you take all the alpha and beta releases into account. And the first edition of the of Java 2 Enterprise Edition was released in 1999. So it makes it, Java EE is basically 16 years old. And this guy, Rod Johnson, wrote a book, G2E Design and Development, in 2002. And the framework code with that book basically led to the Spring framework and the framework we love and know uh, today. But still, Spring is already 12 years old. And in that period of time, from 20 to 12 years old, um, a lot of applications have been, have been built already. Um, some before Spring, some with Spring, some with old versions of Spring. And some of them still exist. Um, I recently came across an application I wrote 10 years ago, and apparently it's still running and still being used. Sadly, it doesn't use Spring. I also came across an application I was working on 15 years ago, and part of that code is still being used. It was transferred from an applet to a server-side application, and now they're migrating it to a microservice or cloud-based environment. But there's still code in there, which is written 15 years ago. So there's still a lot of old code and old software out there. I'm not going to pretend in this talk that I have or in this webinar, that I have all the answers. Um, there is no golden hammer or silver bullet or one framework to solve all your problems or there is not one approach to solve, to solve anything. So there can be a lot of different approaches. And these are things that have worked for me and my company in the last couple of years. Um, also things we learned by migrating projects or upgrading projects to newer Spring versions or newer Java versions or moving away from big application servers or a more service-oriented architecture. So these are basically an accumulation of things we have learned in the last couple of years. And we've built a sample application for that, which is on GitHub, and we are going to walk through it during this presentation. There are a lot of definitions on legacy software. And for this presentation, I, I want to focus on the software that's currently running in production. And it's software that has proven itself generally, and it has been running in production for a long time or for a longer period of time. And because it's still running, um, it has proven its business value. It makes, it makes revenue for your organization in one way or another. And even with all the new microservices or big data and, and business analytics movements we have today, it, we still have to deal with all the legacy applications we have or the legacy that's out there. We could ignore it and let it be and sit, uh, sit and let it be in its place. But eventually it will turn its back on you and bite you and it will basically come crashing down. Ignoring it is basically combined with a full rebuild of the application. And I've been in a couple of full rebuilds or big rewrites and none of them was really successful. And they either failed on scope or budget or time. Those were all projects that started with, with an architect saying, well, we can rebuild this old application in six months to a year. And four years or five years later in the process, the old application is still running and there's still not a full replacement. So full rebuilds generally don't work. Um, as a migration path, you could hide it could wrap your old legacy application in a web service or a REST service or uh, some, other, some other means of hiding it and expose it as something you can use in your new infrastructure. 
However, the thing that we have seen that works the best, or at least in our situation, is a incremental redesign of the application. So taking small steps in redesigning and adding features or refactoring the application. And that's what we're going to look on in this webinar and how we can use Spring and some of the portfolio projects in, of, of Pivotal to help us with that. A lot of legacy or older monolithic applications that are still running in production today have class diagrams that look much like this. There's a lot of classes which have a lot of dependencies with each other. Sometimes they have cyclic dependencies which make things even worse. And these architectures grow because people like me put pictures like this in books we write. Um, we have a three-layered three architecture with a presentation layer, a service layer, a data access or repository layer, and there's a domain somewhere in, in between. Sometimes we mix a domain with a DTO, so the domain is kind of kept secret inside our service layer or service boundary. However, when Every time we put a picture like this in there, there's always a focus that people need to start creating packages around these layers. So there's a service package, a data access package, a presentation package, or a web package, or a domain package, and things like. And when you have a single service or data access layer for a simple CRUD application, there's nothing wrong with this architecture or layering. However, when your application starts to grow, it becomes a bit of a mess. There are several services and different data access layers. There are multiple domain objects, objects which communicate with each other. And it ends up as a big mess, basically a big ball of mud. And that's where we start off with. So let's take a look at a small part of code which we're going to use. Um, a lot of those old applications have package structures like this. So there's a repository package which contains a lot of interfaces for different data access objects or repositories. And sometimes you also find an impl package which contains classes with a nice impl prefix or a suffix. And all of those classes are public. And the same goes for the service and there's also a domain layer, there's also a web layer. And all those packages don't say anything about the application we are working with. So it doesn't speak to us in an architectural way. So we have, a, we have an application, and it's supposed to be a part of a larger e-commerce website. Um, for this tutorial, for this webinar, we're going to look at the user registration part. So. There's a login screen, and we have the possibility to create an account. So we can create an account with a display name. We can enter an email address, and a welcome email will be sent to our email address. Um, I have a fake SMTP server running in the background, which is listening on port 2525. And it's just listening for emails and it will send a message to the console when it receives a message. So if you press save, you should have a message saying welcome and a welcome email has been sent too. So if you now look at the console again, we can see that a message was sent from some email address to the email address we just entered. We don't see, we don't see the actual body, but it's not important. An email, address, an email message has been sent. So now I have a user account and I can use it to log in. Uh, ooh, there are multiple users in there. Interesting. Let's, re let's restart. That shouldn't happen. Let's quickly create a user again. I'm using an in-memory database, so I should have a clean database right now. Uh, 
And after login, we see a account information page, which shows me my username, the name I entered, and my email address. Of course, in the real website, we would have the opportunity to change the password or change my email address, etc. cetera. Um, see the orders, I, the purchases I did, and the status of, my, of the orders, if they are sent or, or not. But for now, this will do. If we take a look at the, there's a single service, it's the user service implementation. And there's a save method for saving a user. And it started out as a simple method. It only saved the user in the, in the repository. However, when the requirements grew, there was a manager who thought it was a good, a good idea to send an email to the, user, to the user, a welcome email. And a bit later, there was also a requirement to synchronize the user with a old backend system. So sending an email, we use the plain Java mail API. So we get a session, we, send, we create a my message, we send it, and if something happens, we throw a runtime exception. There's also some threading going on, because we want to be able to do asynchronous tasks. And the same goes for synchronizing the user. Um, the backend system expects a pipe-separated message, and it should end with a dollar sign so that it can synchronize. There's a client, which you can say, well, send the message, so it gets sent. Also some threading. So there are a couple of problems with this class. It does a lot of things. Um, there's no single responsibility. It sends an email. It tries to synchronize with a remote server. And so there are a lot of things going on in a single server. So what can we do to improve our big, large, monolithic application? Well, the first thought is you need to have a plan. Um, in a couple of, in one or two projects, we tried to redesign an application and just started redesigning and refactoring our code. And after three weeks, we still hadn't we still didn't have a running application. So we went back to the drawing board and came up with a plan, identifying which part of the application we wanted to reuse or needed to externalize. So we could efficiently focus, we could pay attention and focus to those parts which were important to us. So we need, you need to have a plan before you start to refactor. And what we want to, uh, from our monolithic uh, application is we want to have a structured monolithic application. And Simon Brown said, and there's also a nice uh, blog entry from Simon Brown on this subject. He says, if you can build a structured monolith, what makes you think microservices are the answer? And everyone wants to do microservices, but there are very few people or there are who know, really know very well how to write a structured monolithic application. So if you don't know how to write code, when you go, enter into the world of microservices, you get a distributed big ball of mud basically, instead of a uh, microservices architecture which, with all the benefits it should give you. So basically, what we want to do is move from, from what we have on the left side, which is basically a technical packaging on, based on the type of components, so we have a service and a repository, to something on the right, which speaks to us because now we know we do something with a user, and with orders and payments, and we send mail, and we probably also do something with event publishing because there's an event package. So the package structure already speaks to us. And for all the external integrations to our user management or user service, we have a different sub packages. So we have a web interface. So that goes in the web package and our integration with the different parts like email and remote synchronizing go into the integration package. Um, before you really start refactoring and redesigning your application, you need to know what your application does. And a lot of legacy applications don't have a automated test suite. So you should start writing integration tests or unit tests. But as we have seen, the user, user service does a lot of things. So when you write a unit test, it actually is an integration test because it tests the sending of the email, it tests the synchronization of the remote system. So you basically write an integration test on the service level, and not on the web level. So let's see, let's have a look on how that would look. So let's switch branches. Let's go to the desk 
case. And as you can see, the user service is still the same. But we wrote a unit test, or an integration test, actually. And I like to use GreenMail for simulating an SMTP server. And it's a nice small utility which you can use to quickly set up a server. And you could also use Apache James or any other uh, SMTP library out there to, for testing. Um, when you want to test external systems like email or FTP or SFTP, you might need to find a mocking library for that to make it easier to test. So we are using the uh, Spring Convenience classes to write our test. So this is a transactional test. So after the test, everything will be rolled back. We're going to load the application context. So we're still using XML. So everything is in XML. There's, still a, there's even a transaction proxy factory bean because as I said, it's, it's an application. It's based on an older version of Spring and we are migrating to, to newer versions. So in older versions, we only had the transaction proxy factory bean instead of add transactional. So th that's why it's here. So it adds transactions to a target, which is our actual service implementation. Here's our repository. And we have some infrastructure components defined in a separate context, like the data source, our transaction manager, and our session factory bean. So if I kill my server, else I cannot start my mock server, and start my integration test, it should be all green, so for update and testing a new user. So what do we actually test? So we are creating a new user with a certain name, an email address, a username, and a password. And then we say to the user server service, save this. Save this, it's a new user. And because we do some asynchronous tasks, we put in a thread sleep just to, to wait a while to, for everything to, uh, to finish processing. And then we expect a single row in the table um, of course, in the, we could do multi, more uh, assertions here to, to check if it's actually the correct name and the email address, which is in the database for, however, now we just count the number of rows. We are checking if a message was sent, and if a message was sent, if the body equals what we expected it to be. And we also have a, an emulator for the remote system in which we say, well, did we actually receive this message for uh, for the remote service? And everything apparently goes goes well. And we more or less do the same for update user. We expect no message to be sent because it only happens when a new user is being created. And we still expect an update for the emulator. We haven't changed any code. We only added a unit test or an integration test so we could verify that the system does what we expect to do. Now, when we start redesigning and refactoring our application, the tests should still run and remain green. So although everything we do, the behavior of the application shouldn't change, it should, should still add a user to the database, it should still send an email and send out a remote synchronization message to our um, mainframe or whatever service or application it is. So now that we have an integration test, we can start breaking up our monolithic application. And for that, we have to go back to the solid principles, and in this case, the single responsibility principle, which states that a class should have one and no more reasons to change. And for me, the same goes for a component or a microservice, if you will. It has to have one reason for it to exist, and one reason to change. And if you look further in the paper, uh, Uncle Bob or Bob Martin wrote on that, he also states that classes that change together are packaged together, and even classes that are used together are packaged together. However, as we have seen in our architecture, is that we don't have things that belong together in a single package. We have everything in different packages. Everything is public. Um, we have a public use service, we have our public repository, 
or user or domain object, it's it's public. So everything is public. And we try very hard to hide everything behind an interface, but it's just not working with a layered architecture like this because everything is public. Everyone can access uh, our, our user repository or any other repository we decide to build. When we package things together, we can use package protected or package private classes. So we could create a public interface with a package protected implementation. And with it, we can create a public API and use the Java language to our advantage in this case. So there, we are basically hiding our internals for everyone else to see. There are different papers written on the subject or on, on that topic. Um, it's clean code or a hexagonal architecture and or a life preserver. It basically boils down to you should package things that belong together in a single package. And so and you can define a core part of your application and also an integration part of your application. And if you look at our e-commerce system, users are part of the core just like orders, payments, our inventory, they're still, that's part of the core of our application. And then there's the integration layer, which basically means the web, security, web services, or any other type of integration you can, can think of. And each time you cross a border from core to integration or from web to security, you need to think on how to bridge or how to get over that, that hurdle. So. You have to be careful in your packaging and think on the interfaces you expose. So let's take a look on how we could break our user service, which does a lot of things into separate different services. So if you now look at the, so let me close all the other ones. If you look at the service implementations, there are a couple more now. There's a simple mail service. We still have a user service implementation and our, there's also a remote system synchronizer. So our user service is now using a couple of delegates to delegate part of its behavior to. So we still call safe on the user repository. However, send email now delegates to the mail service. Um, we also created a data transfer object, send email, because we didn't want to tie the mail service to our user object. And it contains the subject of the email we want to send, the person it needs to go to, and the actual body of the content of the message. So we construct that in the send email message and just pass it on to the mail service. And that only contains Basically, it's a copy-paste action from what was in the actual send method to the service method. However, now we have different objects, smaller objects, to do the things they are good at. The same goes for the remote system synchronizer. There's a synchronized method, which just contains the method, the content of the method, which was earlier in the user service input. We still have our user service integration test, which still does the same. We haven't changed it. We're still loading our application context, which contains some additional beans, the configuration of our mail service, our remote system synchronizer. And we are now handing them to the user service impulse through its constructor. Hence, we are using constructor arguments. I like to use constructor arguments for uh, required properties. Uh, also, with when using auto-wiring, I like to put add auto-wired on a constructor instead of a field or, or a setter, especially for required dependencies. So if you now run our test case again, if we have done well, it should still be green because it still sends an email and it still calls the synchronizer. And it now does so with some delegation going on. 
However, we still have the same package structure we had before. We still have the services. We have the service import with simple mail service, etc. So the next step is to move it to different packages so that we have single focus packages which do a single thing. So we now have our mail service here, which has a public interface with single method send email. Our send email DTO is still public because that's part of our public API. However, the actual implementation is now package private. So we cannot access it from outside of the package. We only have access to the interface. And as we want to program two interfaces, that's actually fine. So if you now take a look at the user package, it now contains our user domain object, which is again still public. It contains our repository and our service because those things are used together and they belong together. And the repository, our interface, as well as the implementation are now package private. So the only way to work with a user or a user object, object is through the user service implementation, which is also package private because the interface is public. So we still expose our public API, namely the user service and our user objects, but everything else is package protected, package private. Our configuration, so if you now look at, take a look at the integration test. The only change to our configuration is the package. So this was, before it was in legacy service.impl, now it's in legacy.mail. Um, Spring uses, uses reflection to create instances of services or, or beans. Or, so it really doesn't matter if it's private or package private or protected. It, can, it just uses a reflection to invoke the constructor. So we can still create, a, create an instance of our mail service. The construction of our user service has didn't change. Again, also only the imports of our mail service and remote system synchronizer has changed. And there are a little less imports because there's no more user repository, etc. And again, if we run our unit test, which didn't change a bit, it should still work. However, we now have a cleanly structured application as opposed to what we had before. So now we have a nicely structured monolithic application. So what can we do with that? So what's next? So we can start using events to even further decouple our different services because our user service is now still knowing that there's an email being sent and a synchronization with a remote service going on. And for this, we can use the Spring application uh, event or application event publisher. So there's built-in support for, in Spring for publishing events to anyone who wants to know. So let's take a small look. So we created a small integration package. So we have a domain event which is a small interface which only contains a timestamp. We also have an event bus which can emit a domain event. And we have a single implementation of a event bus which leverages the application event publisher from Spring. So we can get hold of the publisher by using the application event publisher aware interface. And we do an additional check in our emit method to see if the incoming event is actually a application event. And if it is, we pass it along to our registered event listeners. So any bean that implements application listener with a certain type of event will receive the actual event. So we have a event logging listener, which logs all events to, to our logging framework. And if you now take a look at the user package, there's 
a few more classes. There's the abstract user event, which has two subclasses, the user updated event and a new user created event. Um, some like it with event, some like it without event. Whatever suits you, uh, use it. There is no rule of thumb, I would say. So if you now look at the user service implementation, which it's very clean now, it only has a user repository and a reference to our event bus. And when a user is saved, we create a new user created event with the newly created user and say to the event bus, emit this event. And the same goes for updates. So now when something happens to the user, we are basically firing an event. And we, we now have an integration package. And in there, there are two fairly small classes. And we have the new email listener, which listens to new user created events. And when it receives such an event, it will trigger the send, the send email method of the mail service. So it now listens to events instead of being invoked directly from the user service. So we have a nice decoupling of different parts of the application. If we needed to do something new when a new user got created, um, register them in a other system or send another email, we could create a new listener for this event and do whatever we need to do without modifying the user service. So we can now add behavior or change behavior without even having to modify our user service. And the same we have done for our remote system synchronizer, which takes the abstract user event, gets the user from the event in this, in this method, and composes the message and sends it to the client. So as I was saying, I prefer constructor injection even when using annotations. So I have add auto wired on the constructor. So we get a client injected as soon as the constructor is called. And now we have a small event-driven application, which still shouldn't change the behavior of our application. It should still send an email message uh, synchronize the remote system, but it's now event-driven. So we have now very loose coupling between our different components and different parts of the application. Um, when using the Spring event mechanism, in Spring 4.2, there are some nice improvements in this area that are going to come. There are transactional events, so you can have events fired when, an, when a transaction is uh, either done or which participate in the same transaction. And also, you don't have to extend application event anymore. Um, I haven't shown you, but if we look at our event, there's an abstract domain event which extends application event, which is a, a Spring Framework class. So next to implementing our own interface, we also extend application event. So in Versions before 4.2, this was a requirement to have to use the internal uh, event bus of Spring. However, with the newer version, that isn't a requirement anymore. So you have annotation-based event listeners. There's one drawback or one thing to keep in mind when using the internal event system of Spring. Um, if you have a lot of events or a lot of listeners, um, it can impact performance because it's a simple collection of all the listeners and each listener is consulted for each event that's fired. So if you have a lot of events, it might severely or impact, at least impact the performance of your application. Unless, of course, you use an asynchronous mechanism, then it, at least it isn't noticeable for the user. So now that we have a you know, modular or well-composed uh, legacy application, we might want to split it into independent services. Um, this is a picture of a, um, well, it's a Fisalia Fisalis, which is basically a, uh, it looks like a single single life form, but it are actually four independent uh, life forms working together to you know, combine a single one. 
So they all work together in harmony for food and paralysis and everything. But it's actually four different parts of this, well, animal. But, so they're four, comprised of four different animals. It's a bit like independent services. They work together to give a full user experience. So now that we have a decoupled application, we could move our users uh, mail service to a separate service and do all need do all kind of neat things with it. So, so we're checking out a specific version of our branch, which for which we eradicated the mail package because that's now in a separate service. We separated the API and the actual implementation. So there's only the interface and the actual object in the mail service API jar. And then you have our mail service application, which is actually a Spring Boot application. So we are using Spring Boot in this application, so we can easily start it and expose it as an endpoint. And we start simple. So this is our application class. And what it does, it just starts an application. It's a Spring Boot application. So we have component scanning enabled by default from this starting with the NL Conspect legacy mail package and everything underneath it. So we don't need this. So let me comment it out. And for starters, we're going to use uh, Spring Remoting. So we're going to use the HTTP invoker to export our mail service to a HTTP endpoint. So we say we want to expose the mail service uh, with this interface and actually this service. And we want to expose it at slash mail service. By default, there's a bean name URL handler mapping, which uses the URL to look up a specific bean in the application context. We still use some asynchronous stuff, but now we use the thread pool task ex executor. And instead of the threading, which we had initially in the mail service, we now use at async. So no more threading inside this method. So we cleaned it up nicely, put at async in there, and it still gets a Java mail sender. So you might wonder where is this Java mail sender configured? Well, that's the nice thing of Spring Boot. It gives you a lot of things configured by default. So just adding these two properties will, or at least one of those, will get you a Java mail sender by default with these properties set. And we're going to run it on port 8090, 8090, and the context path will be slash mail. And later on, we're going to use JMS, so that's already in there. So we can now start our main application. It starts with nice colors, and it should start fairly quickly. Setting dispatcher servlet, it will start up. And we should now be able to access our mail service. So now let's reconfigure our legacy application, the configuration of it, and Later on. It's something we go to use later on. So we now exported our service and let's consume it on the client side with the HTTP invoker proxy factory bean. We say, well, we have this interface, mail service, but the actual call is going to take place on the service on this URL. So this is the port, our root context, and the name of the bean we gave it. So if we now run our test case, and we have everything done, and our application is running, we should still have green bars, because, well, we're still sending an email. Ooh. It isn't, so 
let's increase the thread because the timeout because there is some synchronization going on. Let's restart. Should be restarted because it starts fairly quick. So, so let's rerun. Hopefully, now the test is green. So we just needed to wait a tad longer, which also shows one of the problems when you start decoupling things. And things become a bit more unpredictable and maybe harder to test. So the more you externalize, the more you have to take things into account. I mean, there's another drawback of using Spring Remoting because it's still, it's actually a remote procedure call over HTTP. So there's some serialization going on. It basically serializes the method invocation and executes it on the server. So there are several things that can go wrong with that. And there's also a binary coupling. So if you change the method signature on the mail service or change something in the send email object, we would have to redeploy and rebuild our e-commerce application to be able to interface with the mail service. So that might not be the best solution. Another problem is when the service is down, we couldn't be, we could not handle new user registrations. It would fail because the mail service isn't there. So we might want to add a Java messaging into the mix, so we can have, so we can put messages on a queue, and. For this, we're going to use Spring Integration. We're going to create a gateway, and we basically say, well, create a proxy, create a wrapper for the mail service interface again, just like we did with the HTTP invoker. So we still, for our application, it still looks like we are talking to a mail service, but every method call, all the, the object, which is part of the method call, so in this case, the send email object, is going to be put on a queue, send mail queue, and which is an outbound channel. Sorry, this is the channel. And this is the actual queue name. So let's send mail. Let's do a little renaming there. So we have a send mail channel. We're going to put the method, uh, method argument onto this channel. And the channel is basically going to relay it to this uh, GNDI queue using a connection factory which is here. I already have ActiveMQ running in the background, so we can I can connect to it like this. We also need to change our mail application to use JMS, logically. Um, I used XML for the integration. So we're going to skip the message converter for now. So we're going to use a message-driven channel adapter, which basically listens on the same queue, send mail, and everything it receives, it puts it on a channel. And on the channel, there's a service activator listening, which invokes our send email method on the mail service. Our actual implementation of the mail service hasn't changed. It's still the same. However, we now use JMS in the mix to be able to send email. So now we have that going can restart our mail application. And it should start. It takes a bit longer because it's now connecting to a JMS broker, which is running in the background. So we have a queue, send mail. We already use it today. So there's a single consumer, which is actually the mail application we just started. And we should be able to run our integration test again. And all should still be well. And the counter was six, and it should now be seven. And there should be a sending email. So we still receive an email, but we are now even decoupled decoupled with events and even a Java messaging system. 
The added advantage is if our mail service is down, we can still send messages and the emails will be sent later. So it might take a while, but they will be sent. However, we still have the issue of binary coupling. Um, we still use the send email object in a uh, JMS object message to go to the other side of our mail service. So we still need we still use Java serialization, which might not be the best of ideas to use. So you might want to marshal or unmarshal to XML or JSON. And it's pretty easy to do with Spring integration. You configure a marshaling message converter and give it a Spring, uh, Spring Oxum marshaler. Um, we're going to use Xtreme, which doesn't require a schema or anything. You just say, I want to marshal these objects. So we're going to add a message converter to our message-driven channel adapter and restart our application. And we're going to do the same on the client side. We now have our message converter. It takes a bit longer because there are more objects to inspect. So, and still, if you run our test case again, it should still be green. And now we are using XML. There's just another message being enqueued and dequeued. We still have a single consumer. So now we have decoupled our application with XML. So if you make changes to one side, we don't really have to make changes to the other side. If you use schema, if you use XML schema, then you would have some some form of coupling between the different endpoints. So independent services, you can create those with Spring Remoting, and there are different implementations. You can, we use, I use HTTP Invoker because it's very firewall friendly, because well, it uses HTTP. When using Burlap or RMI, sometimes it's a bit problematic with firewalls because it's a different protocol. You could also use the AMQP, so your method invocation would be an AMQP message. But as I mentioned, it's still a remote procedure call. So it's still Java to Java. It still requires your, your Java code to be on both the client and the, and the server. We also looked at Spring integration with JMS, um, with, uh, with objects. So sending the send email message just as an object, we used XML marshalling. Um, instead of JMS, we could have also used AMQP, which would marshal to JSON and then marshal to JSON. There's still a, there are different versions. You could also export it to a file system and on the other side read it once in a while on all the files. So there are different roads or different ways you can solve the problem with Spring integration. We also use Spring Boot for a for our mail service application, so it's uh, so that we can run it as a self-sufficient service and um, don't actually need big war. So we now have two single separate deployable applications. So what are the lessons learned in all those years and with all those, um, with all, well, all, a couple of big rewrites I was in which failed. Um, I'll start off with a plan or at least have something of plan. It doesn't have to be much, but you have to have a, some guidelines and you have to prioritize your all the things you have, what you want to do, which parts of the application you need to externalize. So you want to have, for instance, a dedicated mail service or remote synchronizing, or you want to split up your orders and payment processing. So prioritize all the things you want to redesign and refactor in your application. And use automated integration tests and unit tests to be sure that everything you do doesn't break the application in a, from, from a functional point of view. So that your application keeps behaving as it as it did before with all the refactorings and redesign you did. And take small steps. Um, as I mentioned, 
once we, we started redesigning without a plan and taking big steps, started at different chunks of the application, and we were building three, four weeks and still we didn't have anything running. So take small steps. This might be hard in a application that already exists for 10 or 15 years, but keep the steps small. And when you're using an older version of Spring, Spring 2.0 or Spring 2.5, doing an upgrade to a 3.x version might not be as hard as you think. Um, look carefully at all the changes that are in the Spring framework or the portfolio projects and figure out the most recent version that still would work for all the capabilities you need. And the same goes for the Java version. Um, we once upgraded from Java 1.4, which is basically a year and a half or two years ago, to Java 1.6. Um, and it, basically it just, it just worked. Um, so it might not, not be as hard as you think. You might run into issues, especially if you use some newer libraries. What also really helps is that you know all the frameworks you use. So know your Spring framework, know all the portfolio products. Also know how Hibernate works and all the different frameworks you, and libraries you use in your application. And to make your code clearer and better, use the right abstractions. You can, use, you can still use the plain Java Mail API, but Spring has a Java Mail sender which makes, makes things a lot easier, so use it. Um, there's HTTP Invoker, there's a, lot of, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with Spring AOP, and there are a lot of things that Spring provides out of the box, which not many people know. So use the, and use the right abstractions with basically all the frameworks you use. So that concludes my slides and my code. All the code is on GitHub. So are there any questions? Hey Martin, thank you so much. That was that was great. Um, there are a couple questions. The first one came in around the time you were speaking about the event logging um, yeah. listener, and yeah. that question was around uh, domain. So it the question is, where do domain classes go? Um, let me take a code with that. Um, what I generally try to do is. Um, Modeling your domain is, is, is actually pretty hard, um, but I try to package everything that belongs together in the same package. And deciding what goes in and what doesn't go in um, can be quite hard. Um, initially, uh, I didn't express that that much, but initially our user object had a couple of references with different objects, like it had a collection of orders and a collection of payments. and what I see in a lot of um, applications is that every relation that's between domain objects is a bidirectional relation. So look closely at your relationships so you can have cleanly modeled components which are really focused on a single task. So that really helps. So I, I generally put the user and the user service and everything in a single package, at least I in, in this example, because those things really belong together. and. If you're doing something with orders and you want to have the orders of a specific user, you can quite easily query for that. So you also have to take a look at all the relationships in your, um, in your domain model to make it easier to break your monolithic application. Would that answer the question? Or yes, thank wrong? you. Another question is, I heard Event Bus has performance issues. How about Spring JMS? Um, well, everything, if you configure things wrong, can have performance issues. Um, I once had a discussion with someone who said uh, Spring JMS and Spring integration was slow. Um, and when I wrote a test case, which basically did the same thing and, and that he was doing with, with his own plain test without Spring JMS, it just it was a couple of microseconds or nanoseconds, which was the difference. Because there was an extra layer of abstraction because of well, the uses of the Spring JMS template and the Spring integration stuff later on. Um, so that's why I said know your frameworks and know um, how to configure stuff. So I haven't, if configured correctly, I haven't noticed any performance issues with uh, Spring JMS stuff. Okay, great. 
Uh, another question is, any suggestions or common issues when migrating from Spring 2 style form controllers to Spring 4 annotation driven controllers? Yeah, that can be a, that can be a painful task. Um, I haven't shown it, and it's still these are still um, oh, sorry, um, simple form controllers. Um, we are on Spring 3.0, 3.2 3 for this because they're still simple form controllers. Um, again, take small steps. Um, what, what we did in a in a uh, in another application is first move to a well-defined or, or more or less structured model uh, model in your application, and then refactor those parts of the application you uh, already externalized, so you can focus on a small part of your application. Um, so it's it's again about keeping focus, but it it can be uh, hard to mimic some of the parts which were in simple form controller. On the other hand, all the annotation-based uh, add controller and request mapping uh, is so much more powerful than what was with the simple form controller. So yeah, just yeah, basically take small steps. Don't take giant leaps. So start with the Spring version, which supports both, and migrate part of your controllers. That would be the advice I I would give. All right. Any other questions? Please feel free to to uh, post those in the Q and A um, widget there. In the meantime, just to let you know, we will be posting the recordings to spring.io slash video and spring.io slash blog within the next two weeks, and it's generally sooner than that. Uh, we do recommend that you subscribe to spring.io video or the Atom feed uh, on the blog to receive immediate notifications of the, of the new postings. Also coming up at the end of May and early June, we have a couple of webinars, which I'll be posting in the window here in the chat window. Uh, May 28th is Debug and Maintain Your Spring Boot app, and June 9th is a comprehensive Spring Showcase personal cloud storage applications. So um, definitely check those out. We'd love to have you join us for those webinars as well. Any other questions before we close for today? All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, um, thank you, Martin, for presenting today. And we hope to see you guys on uh, our next webinar in either late May or early June. Thanks so much.